Think about the importance of music in your life. Do you play an instrument? Do you sing in the shower? Do you love to listen to your favorite music? Well, what if we could take that joy of music, whatever it is for an individual, and use it to restore function in those who are paralyzed? In college, I was a musician who really loved science. Or maybe I was a scientist who really loved music as more than just a hobby. I couldn't reconcile these two things because for the academic world, they seem like chocolate and peanut butter. They just, they don't go together. So after first declaring a major in music, in music composition, I later switched to molecular biology and I continued to pursue music on the side. It just, it seemed like the practical thing to do. Then later in graduate school, I was doing a PhD in neurobiology uh, on the genetics of brain development. I continued to pursue music on the side. I played in bands and I studied music. Uh, I got a certificate in jazz at a conservatory. And for me, music was then, and still is today, always will be absolutely essential for me as a way to express my emotion to the world in a way that makes sense to me. It's healing my heart and it is restorative to my mind. But again, to the academic world, it seemed to paint me as kind of a Jekyll and Hyde character or maybe Black Swan. Well, 10 years ago, uh, I was doing a neurology fellowship in surgical epilepsy. So in the laboratory, I was studying the musical processing in the brain, the electrical traces of complex sound analysis. And then in my art and music studio, I was creating an art project, which I called the encephalophone. So this was a brain computer interface that allowed people who couldn't move to play music again. So it allowed people to play music without movement from brain signal directly. Then as a neurologist, I'm in the hospital and I'm seeing stroke patients and I began noticing in some of these stroke patients a loss of not just their ability to move or their ability to speak, but a largely unrecognized loss of quality of life, a inability to play music. And for professional musicians and in even enthusiastic amateurs, this is pretty devastating. It's, it's a major loss of quality of life. And a light bulb went off my head and I said, oh, I can take this art project I have and I could use it to actually restore that quality of life for these patients, for these people. And so these parallel paths we're finally starting to merge and come together. Uh, so how does this work? How does the encephalophone work? So what we do is we measure the brain activity in a part of the brain called the motor cortex. So this is the part of the brain that tells your arms and legs to move. And we look at that activity. When you move your arm, that activity goes up. But if you think about moving your arm, what's neat is that actually has the same activity. So we can measure that when you're thinking about moving, but you don't actually have to move. Let's try something here to give you an example of that. I want you to close your eyes and just relax and imagine you're floating in the water and you're looking up at the clouds in the sky. So just relax and float and watch the clouds and the sky go by. You're now playing high notes on the encephalophone. So now, I want you to imagine moving your right hand. Just imagine moving it, don't actually move it. Think about taking a squeeze ball and just squeeze and unsqueeze, grip and ungrip. Now you're playing the low notes on the encephalophone. So open your eyes. So what we're doing is we're measuring in that motor cortex, that part that tells your arms and legs to move. When you're relaxed, thinking of the clouds in the sky, 
you're getting high notes. When you're thinking of gripping and ungripping that squeeze ball, you're getting the low notes. So it's a bit challenging and awkward at first, just like any new musical instrument. But the joy it can bring to people who are empowered to play music again is just unmistakably powerful. So just to give you an example, I had a patient in the hospital, Maria. She was paralyzed from the neck down, couldn't even speak. But before all this, she was a musician. She played in bands. She wrote music. She sang. And then she got a brain tumor and multiple surgeries. And she's completely devastated, can't move, can't speak, and can't play music. So in the clinical trials in the hospital, she began using the encephalophone. And when she got to that moment when you could see that she was realizing that she was actually playing music and had control, she began to smile, she began to giggle, and she began to cry in joy at being at this moment where she realized, I'm playing music again for the first time in eight years. So these clinical trials that I was doing, they came out of a desire to show that the encephalophone wasn't just a, a novelty art project, but it actually worked. So in order to show that it worked, I needed to do some experiments in the laboratory. So what we first did was we took normal, healthy individuals, people without any motor disability, some of them musicians, some of them non-musicians, and we had them use the encephalophone to try to match a target note. So we gave them a, a note, and they're playing the note, doing what you were just doing a few minutes ago, relaxing, thinking of the clouds in the sky to bring the note up higher, or thinking about squeezing that squeeze ball to bring the notes down lower. And they needed to try to match the note three times in a row. Well with two different methods, we had all these people, uh, 15 subjects, all of them not only had accuracy and had real control, but they actually had much better accuracy than random. So this was really exciting. It showed that it wasn't just random notes coming out of their brain, but it was actually real control. It really worked. So now that I'd shown that it worked for normal individuals, I wanted to show this could work for people like Maria, who had motor disability. People with stroke, people with brain hemorrhages, ALS, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury, amputees from military veterans, all types of people who have real motor disability. So we did the same type of experiment where we had them match the target note, but these were people who couldn't even move. So not only did they match the target note, with some accuracy, they actually improved over time. So over these six trials, they were able to, they were actually learning. They were learning how to do this better. So that was really exciting and satisfying. Out of all those 12 patients, one of those patients was Jonathan. So Jonathan is a brilliant computer programmer and musician who has multiple sclerosis. So his form of multiple sclerosis affected his brain stem not his brain, so he's completely intact in his brain, but MS has basically cut the connections between the motor cortex that I was just talking about, the part that tells your arms and legs to move. It's cut the connection between his brain and his body. So the way he describes it in his own words are, he says, I imagine the disease like a slippage, slowly losing contact I have with the physical world. So, the scientist in me motivated me to do these experiments. I was very satisfied because I got to show that this not only worked for normal people, but it worked for people like Jonathan and Maria who actually can't move. Uh, that's really exciting, but the musician in me needed to bring this to performances. When they start performing, these individuals are no longer patients, so they become performing musicians, and they're able to connect with the audience and actually be able to create music again and share that with other people. So I put on a series of concerts, and one of the concerts in 2019 showed two quadriplegic musicians, and one of them was Jonathan, playing with a live jazz uh, ensemble. I'd like to show you a, a clip of that.
So this performance brought myself and the band and the entire audience to tears. But the words that Jonathan used to describe the experience in his own words really touched me just as much. So he said, the slippage that the disease causes me to lose connection with the physical world, it's like a curtain coming down over the stage. And the performance with the encephalophone that night opened up that curtain just a little bit and allowed me to peek through and make a real connection with the audience. It was that that made it a really magical experience for me. So we've been able to show that we can re-empower people who have motor disability to play music again and perform as musicians once more. But what if we could take the encephalophone and not just allow people to play music, but we could actually get people who are paralyzed to move again? What if we could take those parts of their brain that's damaged and dormant and repair it so that they could actually start moving again? We're going to do experiments to try to show just that. So we're going to try to show if the encephalophone can make an actual therapeutic or structural difference. We'll look at motor skills improvement, see if they can move better, cognitive improvement, see if they can think better, and we'll look at rewiring through MRI sequences. So this would be looking at the wiring, seeing if those dormant parts by being stimulated can then be rewired and repaired so that someone who maybe couldn't pick up a cup of coffee or even feed themselves could do that again. So we've made these connections. We've made connections to these patients and then performers and the audience. And this talk and these videos, I may be able to connect to more people. But I'd like to share this device with a much wider audience by making a device that would be widely available. This way, someone could, anyone, anywhere who has motor disability could take the device home and they could be empowered to create music again, anywhere. So why is this important? Well, it's probably pretty clear to you by now that music's very important to me, but why is music important in the world? Well, music is not just a cultural cornerstone of every society in human history. It's actually a behavior that's wired into the structure of every human being's brain. Music is not just for entertainment. It's critical in the development of the brain and for learning emotional communication. So by empowering people to play music who'd never been able to move before, it's not only empowering, but it's key to their participation in a truly full life. Thank you.